reflect on what God has done for you. Reflect on the, the people and the moments in your life that brought you to where you are today. And when we do that, it keeps that moment fresh. And what I'm going to talk about today is about witnessing. And somebody witnessed to you to bring you here today. Someone witnessed to me. And are we called to witness? Amen. Absolutely. So before we begin, let's pray. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to be here with us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for yet another opportunity to be here in your presence on your holy day. Lord, be with us now. Send your Holy Spirit as we open up your word, as we talk about important matters. Let our hearts and minds be focused that we may receive a double portion of your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. So we live in a time where diverse ideas about life saturate our country. Social norms and even scientific norms are being challenged and redefined. As Christians, our beliefs are constantly under attack by those who wish to impose, impose their ideas and philosophies on us, even to the point of legislating their morals to force us to get in line with them. As Christians, we have principles that are not made up from us, that are not part of our family tradition, but they're found in the Word of God. And we know that God only wants the best for us. But of course, we know in this world we live in that this is a world that does not honor God. This is a world that is about self, about making money, about possessions. So things like this, when, when we as Christians talk about these things, we get pushback because a lot of times the, the information that people get is not always the truth. It's skewed somehow. If, if I was to read a report about milk written by the milk company, what do you think they would say? <laughs> that, that's right. So whenever money or profits are, are to be made, that tends to be how things are presented in a way that will continue to make the money, right? So these ideas strike at the very core of our beliefs in the Bible and undermine our efforts to educate the world ignorant to the ways of God. And when we come across people, whether it's family or friends or co-workers or, or even when we're online, sometimes these people make us upset. The things they say kind of raise our blood pressure a little bit. And um, after all, how can you justify murdering unborn babies? How can you allow men in the women's bathrooms? How, how, why can't parents decide what is or what is not to be injected into their children? Why are we listening to the dairy and beef industry when it comes to health? And how is a theory a fact when you have no proof. Um, it would be easy to turn off the computer and disconnect from all who oppose our ways. In fact, Facebook makes it easy to unfriend people anytime we want. But what does God think about that? I read this and it gave me pause. This statement should remind us all what our higher calling is. You will never look into the eyes of someone God does not love. Always be kind. That person that we see, that we disagree with, God loves them. Yeah. That person where I'm sitting at the light and I just got done working 16 hours, who is begging for money, who looks just as fit as me, who didn't work all day, God still loves him. For us as Christians, we need to have a spirit of compassion and love for others who do not agree the way we do. And it's up to us to, with kindness, to show them.
I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So this is our commission, right? Is it a little commission? No. What's it called? The great commission. The great commission. <laughs> this is it. This is what we are called to do as believers in Jesus Christ. We are to go. Now, if I tell you to go somewhere, does that mean you sit on your couch at home? <laughs> you have to get up. You have to move. Was Jesus on the move during his three and a half year ministry? Always. He was on the move. We need to be on the move. And it's teaching them to observe. We're teaching people the ways of God. And I'm going to get into that a little deeper because can we teach people without saying a word? Absolutely. So, but we are to teach people all things. And Jesus is saying, I have commanded you. See, these are not our ideas. We are just reflecting the ideas that are taught to us in the Word of God. Yeah. Your mission field may not be in Africa or India, but it is in your home, in your school, and at your job. Serve Christ well right where you're at. And probably the most important place is the first one that's mentioned. It's in your what? In your home. You know, it's important for us to reflect our Christian character to those closest to us, right? Our family, our neighbors, they're the ones that see us every day. And, you know, as a parent, is it important for me to reflect Christ to my children? Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to share with you, this is a book that I've been reading. I wanted to... to buy a bunch of copies and hand it out to the church, but it's quite expensive, but you can get it online, you can download it onto your phone, but if you want to purchase it and have a hard copy, um, I would suggest doing it. It's called Christian Service, and Christian Service, page 9, it says, every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a what? As a missionary. So every true disciple will be a missionary for God. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes a what? Giver. A giver. The receiver becomes the giver. The blessing we received, we now impart to others so that they may be blessed. Is that the system that Jesus has set up for us? Absolutely. The grace of Christ in the soul is like a spring in the desert, welling up to refresh all and make those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. And you know what? There's a lot of people out there that they don't even know they're in darkness. They don't even know they are perishing. The truths that we talk about today in, in our study in the book Last Day Events, do they know that there is something horrible coming. Some feel it, some sense it, but they don't really know. Satan has got them so confused and distracted, they only care about what's on TV, what's in the world, on the news. You know, they follow the news cycle. They're distracted by what is really going on. They're not connecting the dots like we as Christians do. Because if we're watchmen on the tower, we see how prophecy is being fulfilled. We talk about it. It's not just the weather, the crazy weather, but it's also the character of the culture that we're living in today. It's how cold-hearted people are. You know, the Bible talked about even the natural affection. Natural affection is the love between parents and children. And, and natural affection is even going away, where you have parents mistreating children and then children mistreating parents. It continues. It says, our confession of his faithfulness. What are we to confess to the world? His faithfulness and love. His faithfulness. Yes. To Amen. Us. Does, does God love us eternally? What kind of love does God have for us? It's that agape love. 
It's not a brotherly love, right? Yeah. It's an agape love. It's an eternal love. So our confession of His faithfulness, so we're confessing what Jesus did for us, is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. So, do we have a testimony to share? <laughs> We should. We absolutely should. We need to testify of the goodness of God found in the Word of God, but also shown in our life. Because if you live for God, will God impact your life? Yes. Absolutely. Because your faithfulness to God will be rewarded by power from the Holy Spirit. But also, God will give you opportunity if you pray and ask for it to share your faith to others. We are to acknowledge His grace as made known through the holy men of old. But that which will most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. So, what she's saying here is the most effective way to share God is through your personal testimony. Now, the great thing about your personal testimony is can it be refuted? No. no. You lived it. You witnessed it. You are a first-hand witness to your life being transformed. Yeah. So I can testify that my life was like this, and God transformed me and changed me. Now I'm like this. Praise God. It goes back to when I think about AA, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous. They're a good program, and... At one point in my life, I probably should have been a part of it, but I wasn't. But you know what? They have a system where they'll lead you along, but they never break the cord of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. You will always be an alcoholic. But when you come to Christ, you become an ex-alcoholic. Because you are a new creature, Amen. right, in Christ. So those things are no longer attached to you. They become part of your testimony, that's for sure. Yes. But you don't say that I'm still an alcoholic just living my life trying to do better. No. I, that's not part of my life anymore. Amen. Because God has a plan and a purpose for my life, and it doesn't include that. Amen. So the victory over that has been given to me through my faith in God and His love for me. Amen. So... The most effective way of testifying about God is our own experience. Now, does that mean that you need to have an experience? Absolutely. <laughs> Can you rely on an experience you had 10 years ago? Or do you need fresh experiences? Fresh experiences. Every week, every day, you should have an experience with God of how He blessed you and how He worked in your life. And these fresh experiences will not only show you that God is still with you always, but it'll be part of your testimony to other people. Let's continue reading. We are witnesses for God as we reveal in ourselves the working of a power that is divine. This isn't a power that myself created. That's what the world wants you to have, right? They want you to do it on yourself. Self-confidence, right? Self-control, you know, self. No, we can't do it, but it has to come from a divine power to strengthen us. Because as Satan avails us, as Satan attacks us, puts snares, we're weak, right? We're weak, we will fall. But because we have the power, a divine power, we overcome. So we reveal the working power of God in our life. It says, we are witnesses for God. So this witness, we can show them. All people say, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. You're right. You can't do it. But if you allow God to work in your life, you guys will be cooperators in your life. And then you will do it. Right? You're co-working with God. You are allowing Him to mold and shape you. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But... God is constantly working. You're never going to get to a point where you say, like, wow, I'm good. I, I read this a couple times, I'm good. No. God is constantly, every day, shaping us. Let's read this part here in green that I highlighted. Every individual 
has a life distinct from all others. Is that true? Yes. That's right. We are unique. We are all unique and valuable in our own way. And an experience differing essentially from theirs. God desires that our praise shall ascend to Him, marked by our own individuality. You know, this, this, is, this is where the, crea the created being it is so uh, wonderful. God created humans, right? There's billions of us. But he created billions of unique individuals, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Just like, you know, the snowflake. Billions of snowflakes. Are any of them the same? You know, chief, 30 years in the Navy, real hard-nosed guy, master chief in the Navy. So we go to this car dealership, and I was going to buy a van. I saw a van I liked, and I said, okay, Dad, we're going to talk him down. He's like, okay. So I offer him this number, and he comes back with a different number, and my dad's like, okay, that's good. And I was like, no. So <laughs> I give him another number, and the guy comes back, and my dad said, okay, that's good. And I was like... Dad, could you sit down, please? <laughs> he, he, he wasn't the bulldog that I thought he was. So I, I talked to this guy, I talked to this guy, and I got it from some really high number to something just ridiculously low. And, and we went home, and I told my wife, and I told my, my stepmom, and my dad comes in and says, yeah, we talked this guy down. <laughs> and I was like, oh, we did. So when I, when I told my... When we drove from Arizona up here to, to the Northwest, I told my sister what had happened, and she came over and she wanted to rub my head. I said, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I want some of that luck that you have. <laughs> and I said, you know what? It's not luck. Yeah. God blessed me. Mm -hmm. God softened the hearts of the salesmen. Mm -hmm. God knew how much money I had in the bank, and he blessed me. Yeah. It wasn't luck. Yeah. I don't like the word luck. Don't ever use the word luck. <laughs> luck indicates that there's no power, that God is not there involved in it, yeah. that it's random. And in fact, the first three letters of luck are the same first three letters in the word, in the name Lucifer. Yeah. So, I was blessed, because if I tell you that I'm blessed, am I telling you that there's a higher power working in my life? Yeah. Absolutely. So my life is blessed. So... When, when, when people come and they look at Christians and they say, oh, you know, you're, you're lucky. It's not luck. God is blessing us. And you know what we can tell them? God wants to bless you too. This is from Ephesians 2, 4, verse 10. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. And remember, this, this love that God has, this is an enduring love. This is a... a a love that we pay love, this great love, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, your Savior, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. You know, for some of us, if we look back on our life where we used to be, that seemed like an impossibility. At the lowest point of my life, to be able to sit with, with, together with Jesus in heavenly places, it seemed like an impossibility. And there are people out there today that look at their life and what they've made of it and think, God would never accept me. God will never forgive what I have done. 
And they look at me and they say, you don't know what I've done. And I said, you know, there's some stories in the Bible that we can read where you probably didn't do as worse as these people did. I mean, we can look at what David did with Bathsheba. And I don't think there's too many people that sinned as bad as that. But did God accept them back in? Absolutely. It's, let's read it in verse 7. It says, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So as we witness, what are we giving people? We're giving them a gift. Not a temporary gift, but an eternal one. And this is a gift that all of us here sitting today are thankful that we were offered. Is that right? Yes. And are we even more thankful that we received it and took it? Because you can offer people lots of things, but ultimately if they don't accept it, they're doing so to their own demise. But you know what? For us, the Bible teaches us we are not to, to cultivate. What are we to do? Plant the seed. Plant the seed. Give people opportunity to know Jesus. Now whether they accept it or not, that's their own free will. Because free will is another gift of God. He wants us as individuals and all of us out here to choose. Right? That's why baby baptism is so ridiculous. Because baptism is a public declaration of your faith. And is a baby capable of doing that? No. They're not. In verse 10, For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we are his workmanship. We are the result of a life dedicated to Christ. Can you say that about yourself? I hope so. Can people say that about you? I hope so. I hope that when people look at you, they can say, you know what, that person, that's a good Christian there. I don't know, even if they don't know much about being a Christian. They can look at you and say, well, you know, he's faithful anyway. You know, my dad, he doesn't know a lot about my faith. And his understanding of religious things is kind of all over the place. But he understands that I'm firm when it comes to my beliefs. He understands that, he's, that the Sabbath is, is the day of worship for us. And he knows I'm firm on that. And for us as Christians... Even though we love everybody, we're firm on our beliefs, right? Because if you start to compromise your faith to help other people, that compromise is going to come back in a bad way towards you. Because I know even, for example, at my work, if I was to compromise and go to work on a Saturday one day, can I in the future go back and say I can't work on Saturday? No, because I've compromised that already. They've already seen me uh, do it one time. Why can't I do it another time? I want to share with you a devotional that I read from the book, uh, from the devotional, God's Amazing Grace. And this is from June 28th. It says, It is the privilege of every soul to be a living channel through which God can communicate to the world the treasures of His grace, the unsearchable riches of Christ. You know, I highlighted the word living because it, should our faith be living? Should our faith be active? Should our faith have a heartbeat? Absolutely. Our faith should be vigorous. Maybe our bodies aren't vigorous, but can our faith be vigorous? Absolutely. You can have aches and pains and all kinds of, maybe your legs don't work. That, that doesn't matter. Your faith can be alive. Your faith can be the strongest part of your body, and that's okay. Amen. But it also says it's a privilege. It's not a right. It's a privilege for us to serve God. So it says there is nothing that Christ desires so much 
as agents who were represent to the world his spirit and character. What does God desire? Christ-like people. That's what he desires. Because what we're doing is we're representing to the world. Is Satan, does Satan have people representing him to the world? Yes. Absolutely. You see it on TV. Satan has a spirit of selfishness. Yeah. Is our world saturated with selfish people? Yes. That's right. So, for us as Christians, we should be unselfish. And when we are unselfish, we are representing to the world His Spirit. Because was Jesus unselfish? Absolutely. He offered Himself a sacrifice for us. Now, that shows ultimate unselfishness. Can we show unselfishness? Is there anything that we're sacrificing for others? Some of us will sacrifice to a point where, well, I'll do that as long as it doesn't really affect me. <laughs> right? But that's not really the, the sacrifice that God wants for us. If we have to suffer a little bit for the sake of someone else to give them the message, then we should do it. Jesus lived in poverty because ultimately he knows that it's not worldly things that matter. It's spiritual things that matter. All heaven is waiting for channels through which can be poured the holy oil to be a joy and a blessing to human hearts. Do you want to be a channel where heaven can pour out the holy oil to you? I pray you do. I pray you desire that God not only makes you fit for the job, but that he brings people into your life that you can impact. But there has to be a changing, right? The old you will not be fit. The old you is not an acceptable channel. That's why if you read in Isaiah 64, 8, it says, Yet, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. So, for us to be useful for God, we need to be transformed. We need to be converted. Now, conversion is tricky. Franco talked about it this morning. Conversion is not deciding to come to church every week, paying tithes, paying offering. That's not conversion. Conversion is when you, are, you truly gave your life to God. Coming to church and paying, that's, that's just... That's going to happen as a result of your conversion. But uh, we need a converted heart and mind. We need to allow God to shape us into the men and women that He desires us to be. And He desires us to be like who? Like Jesus. God doesn't want a new and improved you. We talked about this. He wants a totally new person. The Bible says a new creation. Not shaped by the world but shaped by the what? By the word. Uh, Acts 1 verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we enter into the mission. And to complete the mission, we are going to need the Holy Spirit power to be successful. The power from heaven is going to transform someone who might have been hesitant to approach and talk to strangers about Jesus to someone who is bold, someone who is ready to go out there. And, you know, it's, it's about, the world calls it your comfort space, right? Right? They ask you, you need to get out of your comfort zone. Now, who's comfortable talking to strangers? Is, is that out of your comfort zone? I know it can be for me. But remember, as God transforms us and as we desire in our hearts to witness to people, we need to do things that we don't normally do. And we need a boldness, right? Because after all, we have an important message to share, don't we? Amen. It's not the bad news. 
<laughs> it's the what? It's the good, the good news. news. Proverbs 28, 1. The wicked flee when no man pursue it, but the righteous are what? Bold as a lion. As God's people, we need to be bold in our faith. Boldness means freedom from timidity or liberty. God doesn't need timid people. He needs people who have a, a desire in their heart to share. And we should be on the lookout always. Who can I talk to? Who can I share with? Be bold. Because you don't know the power behind your hello to somebody. That could start somebody on a path to them finding Christ. But if you don't have the boldness, if you don't have the desire, it won't lead anywhere. And of course, we can't forget about prayer. Do you want your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors to come to Christ? Begin to claim them from God as you pray. Follow the example of our Lord and our priest who tells us in John 17.20. Let, let's go to John 17.20. Anytime we can, we can find an example of what Jesus did. So John 17, verse 20. John 17, verse 20, it says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through the word, their word. So, when we pray, should we pray for other people? Absolutely. Intercessory prayer is very important. You know, God understands the desires that we have for ourselves, health, uh, the future, decisions that we need to make, but we need to lift up other people, and we should lift up people maybe we haven't even met yet. So when you pray in the morning, ask God, bring somebody into my life today that I can talk to, that I can witness to, that I can share my faith to. And do you think God will do that? Absolutely. Just as Jesus prayed that the Holy Spirit would work in the lives of his disciples, we can pray that the Holy Spirit will convict non-believers and give them a strong desire to know God. You know, a lot of times, and I'm guilty of this, I'll look at somebody and I'll say, uh, they're not going to receive the message. That I don't think they're going to take too kindly to me talking about Jesus. I've already made up in my mind that those people won't accept my message. But is that, is that my job to do that? No. It's not. And whether they accept it or not, it's, it's not up to me to decide. It's up to the person receiving the message to decide. And I don't know how many people I've had the opportunity to witness to that I didn't because in my mind I thought, well, they're just going to reject me. But ultimately, they're not rejecting me, are they? They're rejecting the message. So let's not prejudge anybody. Let's just go out in faith and give the message. And, and let the Holy Spirit work on their hearts. And since it's God's will that none should perish, and since God promises to answer any prayer offered in accordance with His will, we can know with assurance that God will answer our prayers. Yeah. And if we're praying for the salvation of souls, is that what God wants to hear? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what God wants to hear. Yes. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, we need to pray with the confidence that God is going to answer our prayer. And we need to pray and ask God that the requests that we are giving him are ones that he wants to hear. To know God's will is to know what he wants of us. And if he desires us to share our faith, and if we're praying for other people or praying for ourselves to have that boldness, he will give us that strength. Mm -hmm. And he will give us that opportunity. So what I want to talk about a little bit right now and I'm going to invite Jim Quilter up in a minute to talk about this more. But what happens after we say hello? 
Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to talk about a few things because, like I said, it's kind of, for some of us, out of our comfort zone to talk to people. But we're just going to do a, a couple tips, uh, not tips really, but just a little, some things to help us. So when you greet somebody, when you, when you say hello, how about a smile? Mm -hmm. A pleasing smile on your face can bring a smile to the other person, right? Mm -hmm. There's something about a smile that people will feel more comfortable and, and at ease with you, right? And how about a cheerful hello? Your first interaction with somebody, you should be cheerful. Greeting a new person politely is the natural way to start a conversation. Make eye contact. This is a very important part of an effective conversation. Whenever you talk to someone, whether a stranger or a friend, you should always make eye contact. And if you avert, because if you avert your gaze, if you're looking around, it seems like you're not interested in them, right? But we are very interested in them. So it's important that we give eye contact. Also, we must observe before we speak. Choose something natural to talk about. You know, there's certain things that anybody can talk about. How's the weather, right? The weather's always something to talk about, right? But look around. Maybe something's happening around you, something interesting. Um, so after the, a casual interaction, you know, a greeting, observe something around you, know. I'm not saying that it's deceptive, but for us to witness, do you think coming to somebody like, hey, I have, can I talk to you about this? How effective is that? Not very effective. Not very effective. But if I came and said, that's some weather we're having. Yeah. And then you, you kind of move into it. We have to be wise when it comes to witnessing. Right? We have to put ourselves in the other person's position. And also, that's why God is saying that your testimony is so powerful. Because... If you just talk about how God has blessed you, you're not opening Bibles, you're not hitting them over the head, you're just sharing your life with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Also, ask good questions, right? You can ask good questions by listening to the, to the people. And, you know, when, when you have a conversation, are one-sided conversations fun? Is it fun to have, where you, uh, you can't get a word in edgewise? No. Ask questions and listen to their answers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what we like to do is in our minds think about how we're going to answer while they're talking. And then when they're done, we, and we don't even hear what they're saying. So let's ask good questions, but also be good listeners. You know, you can share hobbies and interests. You know, when we meet a stranger, uh, you know, think of topics that you can just strike up. You know, if you're on the bus, you know, talk about on the bus. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's are at the park, talk about what's going on at the park. And this is not just with strangers. This can also be with coworkers, uh, people at the bank that you know that you go to all the time, these casual relationships that you have. But we, as Christians, we have interests outside the church, do we not? Yes. Absolutely. And we need to listen. It's It's... It's not polite only to speak about yourself. We should listen to them and, and really hear what they're saying. And as we move from casual conversation into spiritual things, don't take it personal if you're rejected. Don't take it personal. If, if, if that's how they feel at that point in their life, that's okay. Remember, we're just planting seeds. And we don't know their heart. And we don't know where they are. So ultimately, by them rejecting us, maybe it just wasn't their time. I know in my own walk that I rejected many people who came to me with the Lord. It just wasn't my time. Personally, where I was in my life, I wasn't mature enough. I was there was lots of issues going on. But never take it personal. And I just want to share a few examples of successes when people just greeted somebody. So this is this is my first apartment in Korea. 
I, I moved to South Korea in 2003, about April. And so this is where I lived, and I had to walk about a mile one way to work. And at the time, that was pretty far, actually. I didn't think much of it, because when I moved to Korea, I was living in Hawaii, and I didn't have a car in Hawaii, I had to walk everywhere. So I was kind of used to walking. Like, if I had to go somewhere now and they put me in, you got to walk a mile to work, I might not like that. But at that point, it was okay. So anyway, this is where I lived, and I had to walk about a mile to the school, and this is the street that I walked on. And I didn't notice it. Can you notice that building in the back? I don't know if you can see it, but it says SDA on the building. So the road to and from work took me by this Adventist church. And this is where I encountered the mission, some missionaries. And my path towards Christ started with a what do you think? Hello. That was it. The missionaries just greeted me. Hello. How you doing? Fine. You know, and then a casual conversation. And for them, they were on a mission. Well, they were missionaries, so they should have been on a mission. But they were on a mission. And as they talked to me, they, they were gauging my spirituality level. They were gauging my interest in worldly things versus Christian things. And what they did is they, they didn't invite me to go to the movie theater. They invited me to do Bible studies. Right? Our interaction was going to be more along that line. And you know what? For me at that time, as I studied the Word of God, I was convicted in my heart and my life was changed and what began as a simple hello ended with the total transformation of my life and this is let's see this is eight months after i landed in korea this is about six months after i met the, the missionaries and when i went on i went under the water and I came up and I was changed forever by the love and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And not he didn't only transform my life right then, but he transformed my future. Is that right? Yeah. And for me at the time, I was just, you know, 30 years old, I was single, no children, nothing really going on, but God transformed my life. And as you know, I ended up marrying uh, one of the missionaries, and God blessed me. Can I say blessed? Blessed me with two children. Amen. Amen. So my life was transformed by what happened on that road one day. A simple hello changed my life forever. This is John Lai. He was befriended by a Christian at where he worked. And, you know, for us, we go to, some of us anyway, go to a job and we're surrounded by people. Can our workplace be our mission field? Absolutely. So, as we befriend people at work, you know, we can share God's love. And, and, and as we read, our testimony is the most effective way of sharing God's love to other people. So, John was approached by a co-worker who had shared her faith and you know this is why we need to pray and ask God to bring people into our life because there may be people that we work with today that are starving for God's truth yeah. and we have it but we're not sharing it mm. we're not communicating it so let's ask God for these opportunities so as we befriend our co-workers we need to take a chance, right? Let's be bold and introduce Christ to them. And so Nadine took a chance and introduced uh, John to Christ. And you know what? John spent several years studying the Bible and wrestling with God in his own way. You know, everybody's path to God is different. Some it's very quick. Some it could take many, many years. But as the Holy Spirit works on the heart, people are changed. And you know, for John, it went from a, a, a friendship with a Christian 
to becoming one himself. And John made a public display of his commitment to Christ by going under the baptismal waters. And now John lives his life for Christ every day. And now John's life is a testimony to the power of God. Is that right? And now does John have a mission to reach others? And the, the thing about John's life now is God has another agent in the world to work for him. And your testimony of how God saved you can have a significant impact on those around you. Not just strangers or co-workers, but your family as well, right? And the presence of God has an, uh, an incredible ability to bring conviction to those who need to know Him and want to know Him. And one more, this is Hilda Rodriguez. Now, we first got to know Hilda at an evangelical meeting. And early in the meetings, because of family concerns, uh, she had to stop attending. Um, but as it was, Jim and June uh, befriended her at a thrift store. And as they spoke, it was revealed that she had attended some of the meetings, but then had to stop. Well, Jim had given her one of our cards, our church cards, and, and he wrote their numbers on the back. And Hilda had lost it for a year. And then after finding it again, she called. And Jim invited her to church. And he tells me that the very next Sabbath, that she was the first one at church. Even before any of us showed up, she was here. And she was introduced to the Montezza family. And they studied the word of God with her. And as, she, as Hilda studied the word, her heart was changed. It was transformed. And even though she dealt with, with a lot of opposition in her own family, she decided to give her life to Christ. And Hilda went under the baptismal waters and came up a new person. People can walk many years with Christ and never really know Him. We find that with people that are, are in other churches that they, they go through, it's just a ritual. They, they don't really have a relationship with Jesus. But that relationship that Hilda now has is truly wonderful. And the boldness now that Hilda has, she goes, and she's in Mexico now, but wherever she is, she's witnessing for the Lord. Amen. And her light is shining wherever she goes. Amen. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to ask Jim, he's going to speak, and he's going to share his experiences uh, as a witness for the Lord. Jim. Thank you, Brett. I think I can probably be heard without this microphone. I don't like microphones. <laughs> so uh, I'll try to use a marine voice, even though I was Air Force. But David, David's the one with the marine voice. <laughs> and <Sorry. Bruce. laughs> we'll have to hear from you someday, Bruce. But anyway, David is back uh, he's helping to take care of his mother, who is very, very ill. And she's not a Seventh-day Adventist. David and Shirley were baptized as grown adults. You know, by the way, before I go on, Brett, I'm going to ask, you look at this. How many of you were not raised in a Seventh-day Adventist home? Raise your hand. Look at that. Now, we have a responsibility. What if no one told you? You learn something. There's not many, not many poor Jewish people in America. So one moved next door to me, and she had become a Sabbath day Adventist and told me about the Sabbath. <laughs> But anyway, it's my duty to tell others, to tell, to tell him that a former daughter who's now taking studies 
And so we want to pray for her son, pray for her family. And Jonah is in Mexico right now on the mission to take care of her mother and to get her mother to accept Jesus also. But you know, I want to tell you, I want to read four texts that tell when Christ was in his ministry and he started assembling the uh, disciples. You know, he couldn't do all this work alone. We can't do it all alone. We need one of them to pray for each other and to work and, and get out and tell others. I'm going to read Matthew 5, uh, verses 17 through 19 and 22 and this. He was from the King James Version, which I like. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon and Peter. Uh, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting nets into the sea, fishing for fish. He said, and he said unto them, Follow. And then he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship. Uh, well, anyway, when he said this, uh, the, uh, Simon and Andrew, it says, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Excuse me. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And the same thing happened to uh, James and John. You know, they didn't delay. They knew that this was a responsibility. He had told them about this kingdom of heaven and all, and then they told them. Now here's Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, as Prince already read this to you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Sounds like the Holy Ghost is a member of the Godhead, doesn't it? There's a question on that. Sorry to get off on that, but there it is. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. So, there's responsibility. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And Luke 10, 2. Luke 10, 2. Excuse me. After these things, the Lord appointed others, 70 also, and sent them two and two uh, before his face into every city and place, whether he himself had come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great. But the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. It's not going to be easy. But that's you and me, that's us. And those who were raised in Saturday at this moment, do you, how about you? Do you feel that you are? You know, that you don't have a thing to do? Well, anyway, to get to our responsibility, um, as Brad was saying, you know, smile when you go out there. There's a song written in 1935 that says, uh, you can smile when you can't say a word. You can smile when you can't be heard. You can smile when the may be Gray or fair, you can smile anytime, anywhere. So when you're doing this, you want to introduce yourself with a hello and a smile. At first, I thought Brad was only going to say hello, but you have to smile. You know, don't you? There's too much uh, hardness and meanness and bitterness in the world. And so when you go out there, you want to do that. Now, one other thing that I want to mention before. Uh, before getting from this, I'm kind of jumping around here. But anyway, we 
have these little cards, they need to be redone because we have a phone number on here that I think is not working and we need to get that. But it's the Linwood, it tells our location, it tells our meeting hours, and uh, uh, that's, this is the exact thing. A card exactly like this is what I gave to Hilda, and she lost it for a year. Maybe the time wasn't right. We don't know why she lost it for a year, but uh, she's with us. Praise God. <laughs> it's wonderful. If, if you've never experienced bringing something to Jesus, you really are lacking something. Because yeah. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah. I felt pain from bringing someone that I didn't follow through on. Um, uh, Pastor Ray, Walter Ray, who wrote the book, The Great the White Line, I befriended this only one word, uh, ran the garage from her, and then um, I, had, I didn't have much time to go to church with her. We lived off elsewhere, so I sent her to the Alhambra, California church, which was very near this elderly lady, not even knowing about Walter Ray. And I told Jude, I hope that she, I'm sorry to say, I hope she passed away before, when she was still strong loving Jesus, before he got to her and turned her away. Anyway, you know, there's others. Uh, there's someone that has come. I met Kevin in the Taco Bell. The Taco Bell. And Kevin wanted to come here. We got to talking. And... Uh, He's been here a few times now. He wants to learn about the health ministry. Do we have a health ministry? So we have a lot of things to talk about and tell people. And so when you go out, don't overpower them. Don't introduce yourself by saying, you see, brother? <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? That's the way you would... I mean, I've heard it before. And even though I'm certainly a Christian, I was kind of offended by that they would just jump right into that. But anyway, we have wonderful literature that uh, June is, uh, June's always a part of this by talking to Hilda, uh, Hilda and all. Many times she'll uh, come and get me and introduce me to the people and all, but she loves to give out these little things. There's one on the Sabbath, sanctification, judgment, the seal 666, the second coming, there's about 10 of these with scriptures. There's, they don't have the spirit prophecy. This is all scripture. And uh, then there's these magazines. If you think it's tough working here, this magazine is the voice of martyrs. This is about people who are working where if they just speak the name of Jesus or show a Bible or a page from the Bible, their life could be stuffed down. Now, that's when it's for Jesus. And we won't go out. We won't go out where are we kidding? And uh, here's Volunteer, which is Maranatha's magazine about, uh, you know, about building churches and so forth. Uh, we have uh, a couple members who are active in that. And here's, we used to have the almost forgotten command, and now we have the forgotten command. It's just about gotten to that point. Now, Fran was just telling me this morning that uh, she went to the farmer's market. And Fran is really active in this. And Christine is really active. You know, Christine works with the homeless, for those of you who don't know her. How do you feel? You, you don't have to do that ministry, mm -hmm. but are you still going out with people you're going to think, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know about that. And yet, somebody told you about this truth. Mm -hmm. If you don't do it, get to thinking about maybe somebody will not hear about that message. It's going to be a terrible responsibility on okay? mm -hmm. And this is a good book, too. This thing is really hot at this time. You must that movie was made. And in the back, it tells about his life. Now there's another book that's been written that's even more complete than that on his beliefs. I love to hear that way and tell 
uh, gave away one just the other day to a fellow who's in the rehab. But anyway, we have all of these things. There's these little things. Uh, there's just no reason for you to feel timid. Here's one, super food. So uh, here I was in Taco Bell trying to get a healthy <laughs> <laughs> Oh, substitute beans for beef. You know, <laughs> he didn't talk about that. And uh, he heard me, Kevin, who came a couple of times, he's an insurance agent. Uh, he was, he said, boy, he has a hard time. But he, he managed to get something that he uh, didn't want without having meat. And it just trying to get away from that. Anyway, I better end up here. But if they get to the point where Bible studies, amazing facts. We have several Bible studies that you can give them, but always try to give them something. Even if it's only the card that they can lose for your life. Just so they go to Jesus as soon as possible. But always give them something and leave them with a smile and encouragement. But uh, don't don't neglect. By the way, I need to, I need to tell you. Uh, there's several times in a life, a person's life, when they are going through uh, life changing events, very stressful. If you can connect with them at that time, if you see someone who you feel is really suffering, don't turn your back on them. That's the time when they're very vulnerable to wanting Jesus in their life. Here's some of them. You can name some yourself. I'm going to read this off pretty fast. We can spend five minutes on each of you. Death of a loved one or dear friend. Terminal illness of yourself or loved one or close friend. A prison sentence or a jail sentence for yourself or loved one. Move your residence. Marriage. Birth of a child. Uh, let's see. What else uh, serious car accident, divorce, natural disaster, flood, earthquake, home destroyed, serious illness of yourself, loved one, or friend. These people need to talk and we need to listen. Mm -hmm. But we have something they need. And let's get out there and share it. Don't be afraid. If they reject the message, they're not just rejecting you. They're not even rejecting you, probably. They're rejecting Jesus, maybe. So don't be, uh, you're, you're just out there to sow seed and be kind and be someone that they are to be attracted to later. Give them something, leave them something, and the rest of it is not yours. But be encouraging. And when you leave this, but you're in the mission field right now to, to encourage one another. But when you leave this place today, remember, you're in the mission field. You are a missionary. You don't need to go to the I want to tell you this. I talked to, uh, I ended up next, I talked to the, to the Ken shows yesterday, and they had Ken to come to be up here in a couple weeks. So he said, in closing, he said, um, I was asking about Pastor University. He's a naturopathic doctor. He said uh, that their first graduate is going to come up here and go to Baxter University. So I said, wow, that's great. And I'll be encouraged. We hung up. I called him back and said, oh, boy, I'm glad I received you. I reached you. I said, send me the name of that guy who's going to go to Baxter University. He's a Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, yeah, he said. I said, send me his name. I'll write to him and invite him to this church. Mm -hmm. Just pray to go. Pray about it. Pray about it. Busy about God's business and your mission, your ministry. All right, thanks a lot, Jim. You know, Jim has a love of God, and that love will be transferred into a desire to share with others. You know. And let's pray, let's ask God to be with each and every one of us, even if. You, you know, working, there's nowhere to go. There's somebody you come in contact with that yeah. you can bring this to. But let's purpose in our heart, ask God, let's pray, and ask God 
to bring people into our influence, area of influence, and let's work for the salvation of souls. If I can get the choristers to come up here, we'll close. We'll close. I, I have a few more things I was going to share, but I'll save it for next time. But let's close. Uh, start closing him. Number 